Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Rob Schmidt, and this is series number seven of the Talbot County Public School webinar that we're providing each month on topics uh, of importance to all school, uh, of all school age children, the parents and grandparents, and also our school staff. And this support is being provided each month with a variety of topics. And this, this month in, in March, we are looking at what does stress look like in the school age population? And that is across the board. And we're gonna go through some things here and you'll hear me say a lot of repetitive things like for the name of the person, Dr. Hans Salih, who is the founder of stress, I guess the, I, I'm not the founder, the father of stress um, and the stress response model that I think it's important for us as coaches or school staff or parents to be made aware of that can help identify early on some of the things that um, maybe some of the exhibited or shown behaviors from our kids in our classroom. Um, next slide is... Learning objectives. So hopefully today uh, you'll have a chance to look at some of or become aware of childhood stress and common causes. We'll look at some of the uh, familiarity with initial signs and symptoms associated with stress and increase insight and understanding of, of Dr. Hans Salier's stress response model. And uh, we'll go over that pretty much in detail and develop some action steps we could use or early identify to alleviate or how to manage uh, maybe some chronic stress, especially as we get into um, the, I guess, the last quarter of the school year. So what is and how do we look at and where does the word stress even come from? So stress is experienced, first of all, by all of us. And if you can't, if you can't tell right now, I'm a little stressed out even doing a, each, each of our webinars, I get a little stressed out. And it's short-lived, so it's a daily occur occurrence overall for all of us for different tasks that we have. It could be even driving to school. It could be even waking up, figuring out what clothes we're going to wear today, um, what we're going to have for dinner. I mean, these are commonalities that all of us experience. If you didn't have stress, we probably would not be alive because there are different uh, types of stress that motivate us to complete a task or a job or a paper or the study for a test or to practice or, you know, figure out a project at work, what we can complete. So, and stress usually uh, first began actually in the world of physics and uh, to describe a force that's, that could be countered to alleviate or decrease the force level or damage that a force may cause. So it's kind of like the counter resistance to anything that we do is that it's going to minimize the damage from that initial force. And it's pretty much how our bodies operate in general. Um, and it was first used as a psych in a psychological as a psychological concept in 1936 um, to identify some of the impact of in our lives, in our well-being, um, in our physical being, and in our livelihoods. So in essence, what stress even is, it's our body's reaction. And the word perceived here, perceived threats, because each and every one of us have different perceptions of what a stressor may even be or what a perceived threat may be, given our own lived and lived experiences. So um, what may be a stressor for you may not be for me and vice versa. And the same thing with any sort of a trauma experience. We may have different lived or shared experiences that may be self-perceived as what a trauma even is for each and every one of us. So, but in general, um, perceived threats, situations, pressures, challenges, and other kinds of demands that are placed on us that may supersede, may override our abilities, maybe even to cope, or maybe we can cope temporarily but if the stressor is still there, it's a, eventually going to wear down our coping skills. And then we we're, that's where we uh, can get into trouble. That's where our students can get into trouble to chronic th uh, levels of stress and demands and challenges that if, if, if it's not identified early on, it may transition into something more prominent and um, looking at anxiety, for example. And we'll talk about some of those kinds of things. 
Um, the father of stress, Dr. Hans Salier, talked about stress is a nonspecific response because it does not affect each and every one of us the same way of our bodies or the impact. Remember, we talked about a little early on up top there, the force um, and how that our, our bodies respond to that demand in a different way than what would, in other words, there's no universal stressor that affects each and every one of us the same way. So stress is the non-specific response of the body's reaction to that, to that or any, any demand. And that's where it places us in a category that it's good to be made aware of some of the things that, um, of our limitations and our breaking points because we all have them. And again, e stress and trauma affects each and every one of us quite differently. So there are two basic types of stress in general. Most importantly, it's good to know we have to have stress to live. Each and every one of us has different stress levels. And you stress, which is a positive, kind of like a battery, on a battery, positive, negative, right? So we have the positive stress, and that usually motivates us. It pre prepares us to, to perform, to do well, to study, to accomplish a mission or a task, um, and to excel. Because one thing we do know is that the mother is a repetition of learning, right? I'm sorry, repetition is the mother of learning. And the more we do something, the more confident and competent we are in completing that task. Or if we practice, the more we do something, the better our, better we, we are much better to perform with greater results and outcomes than someone that does not prepare. So practice does make perfect to a degree, yes. So it usually is you stress, like the ability for us to complete a task or a job is short term. So the stressor is short term, kind of like this presentation, it's short term, it is stressful in preparing for it and completing it, especially live. Um, but it's over quickly, and then we can bounce right back to where we were, the homeostasis level, and we'll talk about that in the uh, general adaptation syndrome response, stress response model. Um, so it's short term, and it's usually within the confines of our abilities to cope. So it's within our coping skills to complete the task, do preparation, of course. And uh, again, the more you do something, the more confident and competent you are in whatever that task or job may be. So we do and will have increased confidence in prepar preparing for maybe that season, uh, maybe for track or cross country or for practicing for the band or studying for a test. And the more our kids are exposed and have time set aside in time management, the greater the likelihood of that child doing well in whatever that ta task may be. Again, it could be band, it could be a sport, could be foul shooting, it could be doing something in art or a project or a paper or studying for a test. Now, when our ability to cope is overrun because of the prolonged nature of a stress, that's called distress, and that is a negative impact on our bodies and on our emotional well-being. It's negative stress. It's not good in essence, and it occurs when you're feeling and and when I say you, I'm, I mean, also us being aware of our kids and if teachers out there, you know, you know, your kids, 20, 25 kids in a classroom, you have a good idea of the noticeable changes or differences during the course of a year. Once you get through that first month and feel you have a good, a good eyes and set of what that homeostasis is in that child of how they normally function. And you can usually pick up offsets of that. When they're not doing well, having a bad day, overstressed, excited about an accomplishment. Um, but it occurs when you're feeling, our students are feeling consumed or overwhelmed with too many worries, expectations, tasks. Um, your body begins to respond. Remember that unspecific, nonspecific response to whatever that perceived threat may be? Your body begins to respond by sending physical warning signs that it can't keep up or manage at this pace with this level of worries or situations or stressors that are put on us, and again, it's self-perceived individually, so we can't maintain this level. We can't combat that. Remember when, when it's used in physics to offset this force. We can't, we can't hold this up much longer. Something's got to give. And typically, it's our physical and mental health well-being 
in combination, something's got to give. So with that creates anxiety. It can either be short-lived or long-term. Again, anxiety is that constant feeling like I'm never going to be able to get through this or finish this task or problem or season. Constant state of worry where it's starting to affect us physically and emotionally. We're maybe can't sleep. Like, you know, we're having these racing thoughts. We cannot shut our brain off. I'm constantly worried about this. It's affecting our relationships and parents. You will see this noticeable changes in maybe snippiness uh, or avoidance. And we'll talk more so about this through some developmental stages later in some slides. So it can either be short lived or, or, or I mean, it can either be short or long term, depending on what the impact of that stressor, the intensity of that stressor is. Outs, it's and it usually falls if now if it's short lived, it's really intense. So it pretty much exposes our child's ability to cope. Or you know, again, teachers, parents, we're all stressed out, especially parents running around this time of the year, uh, running our kids around to maybe ball fields or practices, and coming home from work and having to go to the fields or having to do this or do that and still figure out how we're going to cut the grass, fix dinner. I mean, parents also keep in mind for you. Also, this definitely applies to all of us. So so it's outside of our ability to cope. Again, something's got to give. Um, the only difference is between uh, school age uh, students and adults is that typically adults already have some preconceived notions of how to deal appropriately with some problems where maybe some of our kids, our students do not have those skills quite yet developed. And that's the difference in picking up and being able to pick up and identify early on some of these changes in our behaviors. And again, parents, I know they're at school six and a half hours a day for 10 months out of the year. So, you know, teachers, you're really well positioned to notice, notice these and identify these changes in behaviors early on. And to send to the school counselor so we can, you know, get our parents involved to figure this out together um, uh, to address any of the noticeable differences or decreased grades, attendance, or any sort of increased disciplinary referrals. You know, we schools in general, all schools, public or private, are well positioned to identify these noticeable daily changes that need to be addressed and adopted and shared with parents so that us as a team we can identify some supports and, 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 and some resources to put in place to help offset some of these inability characteristics to cope with whatever that stressor may be. Um, so again, it decreases uh, our ability to perform well in school. You know, I, I know we're coming up on the testing time of the school year and being mid late spring where we have standardized tests and I'm thinking about for our seniors and juniors for colleges and figuring out, or just in general, what am I going to do if I'm not going to school? Um, trying to figure these things out also is anxiety and stress provoking. And, you know, it's going to, it's going to really negatively affect our ability to cope because we are just the intensity of this time of year for a lot of our students is it can be overwhelming and it definitely needs to be addressed so we can conquer this. And it definitely is workable and fixable. So for example, the Yerkes Dotson model law. Um, typically, this is called the old bell shaped curve in statistics, um, inverted U model. So, where we want to be, of course, on a typical day, homeostasis is a straight line where we normally function every day with some offsets. So we get some lows, some, some lows, and we get some highs. But overall, we're functioning. We, we're able to bounce back on either side of that. But this is taking a look at a snippet, maybe of a course of one event. And typically, if we don't have enough stress, we're going to be or appear to be sleepy, fatigued, not really motivated to do anything because we're really not called to do anything like our, our um, maybe our, what's the word? I'm looking for this word. And that's one thing about doing this live that crushes me because I can't think of that one thing. Like our demands maybe are not really placed on us. So at home, we may act differently, but at school, there's a high level of demands. So we may be more stressed out at school. 
because we have higher expectations because there are a lot of different things to do at school. Maybe that maybe not there at home, like over summer break or just maybe during an Easter break or spring break. So we may appear like a little lazy, lethargic, tired, fatigued, maybe sleep in. Um, and then as a little bit more demands are placed on us or chores, you know, we may feel a little bit stressed out. We can deal with it. We can conquer it. But where we want to be is right there at the top with a big smiley face of optimal arousal where we can usually be called to handle a task and complete it and go back to the left side and a regular mellow mood until something else comes up or an expectation comes up or paper is due. And we could rise up. We could, we could complete that task and just go back to that line where we're not overly aroused. But there needs to be a level of that to complete that paper, right? Or to study for that test or the practice. Or if you're in competition or band or marching or um, art project or any sort of project or research project, um, there needs to be a higher level overrunning that level of normalcy, which is homeostasis. So you're going to rise up, complete that task, and you may have a law and go under homeostasis because you may be a little bit sleepy and fatigued and completing the tasks when it's complete. So we're going to regroup, right? And then if we're overly aroused at a chronic state, like there are a lot of demands on us and we have to run around, we have to come, we have to get ready for these tests. I not only, not only have SATs coming up, but I have a lot of uh, tests at that same time. And I practice to go to, and I have maybe the scouts to go to, or I have community service to go. It just can be overwhelming. And it, it will change the way our normal functioning will be, social and emotional well-being. It will definitely change that. And, you know, one thing that overexposure to stress does for all of us is that it also decreases our immune system. So we are more prone to get sick um, because of the level of stress. Um, prolonged stress can result in anxiety and depression, and it can also, like if we get stage fright, like if we do prepare or overly prepare, we can function the same as if we didn't prepare, we may freeze. Um, and you'll hear that a lot in our students. Sometimes they'll be very prepared to complete a task. And then the test is put right in front of them. I can't believe it. I forgot everything that I studied. I spent the whole weekend studying. I don't know what happened to me. So being mindful of that also of over-preparedness can result in the same as not being prepared. So let's look at some common causes associated with symptoms of stress. So what, what are causes? And then we'll look at some symptoms related to that, those causes. So, you know, being worried about grades, projects, schoolwork, uh, peer-related social problems with friends or peer pressure, maybe feeling bullied. Again, bullied falls into the same um, category with stress and trauma because it's the perception of that person and lived experiences of what that bully may be or what the bullying behaviors are. So we, I may feel like I'm being bullied, but the same thing is done over here. The person may not feel bullied. Regardless of that, it needs to be addressed and taken seriously. So it's usually that prolonged um, uh, behavior that results in what would be identified as being bullied, or if it's one major event, we'll address that further down the road because I think our next uh, webinar, number eight, we'll, we'll focus specifically on bullying and bullying behavior and resources and how to report that. Um, on both the bullied perspective behavior and also on the victimization of bullying and what those symptoms look like. But we they need to be addressed early on so we can prevent, remember, the negative impact of that. Um, interpersonal conflict, having negative thoughts. I'm never going to pass this test. Um, I'm not going to finish this race. I'm going to hit a wrong note. Um, I'm going to strike out. Um, those are typically not good to have those negative thoughts because it's gone back to feeling like I am overly stressed out or maybe even not prepared. I'm not meeting expectations of what my mom and dad want for me or my grandparents, or I'm not going to live up to my brother or sister's expectations, or my teacher feels like I'm going to be here 
and I don't feel like I'm going to be there or my mom and dad want me to go to this school. I don't think I have the grades to get into that school. I mean, all of these types of expectations of, or self-perceived expectations of what others will believe or feel about me if I don't meet those expectations, that, that can result in some pretty significant outwardly types of behaviors that can be picked up and identified early on. Increasing responsibilities, again, kind of like what I said a few minutes ago, sports, friend time, downtime, parental pressures, chores, relationships, and it's, it can be never ending. I have to clean the litter box. Uh, I got to find a, 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 a date for prom. Um, I got to get a job. I got to help out, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things. Feeling rejected or not accepted um, in some way or manner is hurtful. Feel stressed out about that. Again, as I go through cafeterias throughout the, the school year, it's I hate to see students sitting by themselves. It's unacceptable to me personally, because you know, you have two, three hundred kids in the in the in the cafeteria. And unless someone is separated for a reason, there should be no kid sitting by themselves because that to me that raises a flag, what's going on? And it could be feeling rejected and not accepted by maybe uh, the same age peers. Uh, perception of having to be perfect, which is a self-defeating perception, because then you feel like you're not even meeting your own expectations, because if you get in a B instead of an A, and your expectations is an A um, in a very difficult class, I feel like it could be um, a spiraling effect that can affect our self-esteem and, and um, you know, our goal achievement and obtainment. Loss, loss could be a loss of a pet, loss of a family member moving, coming here to the United States, um, leaving behind. Um, it could be, again, a parental separation, it could be breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend. It could be anything along those that my pet ran out and never came back. You know, any sort of loss or perceived loss. Family problems, again, not being allowed to do something, being punished. Um, again, mom and dad are arguing, and then I come to school, and I can't just escape because they have all these expectations here at school. Anger, just a constant state of being in anger or short fuse, which parents pick up on beautifully, and also school staff pick that up because there are noticeable changes in behavior. Again, increase or prolong exposure to stress will sh more than likely result in a student being sick um, like often. And, you know, part of that is uh, picked up in our wellness centers in our schools where our school nurses pick that up also because it's like, it's the third time I've seen you in here over the last couple of weeks. So what else is going on? So the general adaptation syndrome, it was first identified and created by Dr. Hans Sully, the father of stress and stress response model, and talks about our stress response system, how it defends and then fatigues. So if we can think about whatever that first um, initial stressor is, it usually sounds an alarm within us. We can feel there are noticeable changes physically, like we get stressed out and tense. And then we try to ward that off, whatever that stressor is, we try to ward that off. It's called the resistance. And we try to show that it's our body's resistance to stress, it can, but it can only last so long because our body uh, pr uh, promotes a lot of different chemicals to help offset this, to get us back to that homeostasis level, which is right in that, that right down that, um, that chart line, right dead center of that, you know, we heighten up to meet that challenge. But if it's that constant state where we just feel like we're not going anywhere, we're treading water, we can only hold that up for so long before our body then fatigues and stresses out to the point where it looks like we're fatigued, we're maybe sick, we develop some sickness and our school nurses do such a great job because if you look at the national statistics on like our children, when they go to the wellness center or the school nurse, that during the course of a year, that 65% of all wellness center visits to the nurse are usually related to what's called um, like, there's a lot of, there's a lot, the, the child's reporting that something's wrong with them. They're called somatic complaints, but there's physically nothing found by 
the nurse. So there's no temperature. There may be belly aches. We we are self-reported to the nurse. So there may be belly aches. There may be headaches. There may be chest pain. Um, I just don't feel well. I don't know what's wrong with me. And so 65 to 70% of all wellness center visits are typically unfounded related to somatic complaints where the identifying reason for the for the nurse's visit is unfounded because it is usually rooted in stress. And one of the things that's well noted uh, by Dr. Hans Salier in our stress response model, the general, the gas for sure, general adaptation syndrome, is that during stress and exposure or prolonged um, levels of stress produce themselves or find themselves rooted in our weakest organs given signals out there that we can't maintain this. And under stress, and it's well documented, that our weakest organs are given, where I may have to go to the bathroom a lot, I can't go to the bathroom, chest pains, I have headaches, I lose my appetite, or we are filling this void by overeating to get as a, as a, as a coping skill to try to fill that, whatever that is. So something over a period of time has to give in because we are going to get really sick. And um, that exposure to that stressor needs to be addressed and our adopted coping skills to offset that. And it's good to be a part of a team because we can do that. Parents, you can do that and noticing that those changes in your children, our teachers identify them and may make a counseling referral to the school counselor, for example, our school social workers, or we have several mental health practitioners in the community that come into our schools to provide school-based services. Um, all of which you would be identified and noted of the reason for that for that um, counseling referral. So again, stress will affect each and every one of us in general quite differently. So developmental stages of stress and how that may affect the youngest of kids, you will see for ages just in general. Um, there's nothing uh, black or white or set in stone about this, but just in general, Typically, the youngest of kids, ages four, five, and six, maybe even seven, you might see some regressive behaviors. And these are going back to maybe seeing some toileting accidents, thumb sucking, uh, maybe the inability to maintain a level of attention. Um, you may have some behavioral tantrums you're seeing, difficulty um, separating from the parent, like when the parent, if there's a car rider dropped off or they're getting on the bus, may want to, or even leaving the house in the morning, may seem that your child is more clingy to you. Um, stress lowers pain threshold. So you'll see tummy aches and, and sleepiness and physical complaints and temper tantrums, possibly. Um, these are all just signs and symptoms, symptoms typically seen. Um, maybe uh, back to opposing any sort of bedtime regimen or, or scheduling that you have or eating. I'm not going to eat now. I'm not ready. I'm not hungry. I'm not going to bed now. Or may even counter that by going to bed or falling asleep earlier. And we sometimes see that in October, November, typically. Um, refusing to go to school. You can't make me. Um and also identifiable physical tics. Um, you might see some hard eye blanks like that. You may see some nose twitching a little bit more, changes of mouth, like just trying to fake yawns, um, picking of skin, cuticles, um, uh, biting fingernails, toenails, you know, those kinds of things and scratching or pulling on your eyelids, you know, those, uh, uh, I'm sorry, eyebrows, uh, eyelashes, you know, those kinds of regressive behaviors you're, you haven't seen for a long time. All of a sudden you're seeing these things. Of course, first thoughts are, first thoughts are why is this happening? What's going on? If you look at about ages uh, nine to 13, these are our tweens. So developmentally, it's always already a increasing awkwardness to our tweens. Bodies are changing. Hormones are going hundred miles an hour, like a level four rapids. Um, so there's al already a physical heightened stress level on the body. Um, and it may not be related to a stress level. And that's sometimes where we see our teens sleep, sleep a little bit more. 
um, look a little lethargic or awkward um, and gait and walking and just like, uh, or the over heightened sense of arousal. Skull avoidance, somatic complaints, again, feeling like there's something wrong. Um, might get some quick blurting out things or reactions. I wish I was dead. I can't do this anymore. You know, those kinds of things which need to be taken serious. Um, increased resistance, complaining, worrying, fearful about things, decreased appetite or over appetite, overeating again. And you might see some also initial signs of if, if some of the stressors are not resolved in a timely fashion, some depressive type symptoms, again, sleeping too much, pulling back from school, decreased grades, not wanting to go to what would normally be pleasurable activities, you know, participation in hanging out with friends or going to practice or decrease if they're a good athlete, if your son or daughter is a really good athlete or trying really hard, you see that pulling back where you don't see the out, uh, outcomes being positive. There's some definitely some changes. Um, same thing with our teachers, noticeable differences in behavioral problems at school or not coming to school or decreased in grades or behavioral problems that were not there before. What is going on? Or if your child, uh, you know, cannot go to sleep at night for some reason, because we're having these racing thoughts. I just, mom, I can't seem like I'm shutting off my, my brain. I just can't stop thinking about this. Um, heightened levels of social or peer sensitivity or interactions, some of those differences. And then we get into our teenagers and you might see some more oppositional types of behaviors, um, challenging. Why do I have to do this? Why can't I hang out? Why do I have to come in by 10 o'clock? Why can't I go to the movies with my friends? You know, or why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Just challenging any existing household rules. And uh, also with our teachers, challenging, why do I have to do this? You know, you can't make me. Irritableness, increased attitudes, mental health, again, looking at, and we covered anxiety and depression and oppositionality. We covered that, I think, in our webinar number four. I'm sorry, webinar number six, the previous one with, with um, oh my gosh, uh, with our psychiatrist, staff psychiatrist um, who provides services to us, our school social workers who provides oh, a consultation, and I forget his name, oh, Dr. Jeff Bostic, and look up session uh, webinar number six we covers a lot of these symptoms related to school age behavioral changes internal external behaviors sleeping more maybe more tearful maybe more aggressive avoid uh, avoiding eye contact avoiding to discuss anything related to anything that that child may be called out on or pulling back so again these are noticeable difference internal or external changes in behaviors that need to be identified and addressed before they, the child, um, you know, begins feel, feeling like they are being isolated inside. Nobody's picking this stuff up. So they're going to send us messages and it's our job to pick those things up. Isolative, detached from school or family, feel like I don't belong. I'd rather be alone, not go to school. Nobody really cares. You know, those kinds of attitudes and changes that are verbalized Eating or sleep disturbances, more negative perception of themselves or life in general, moodiness, decreased concentration, which we would see, again, a change in some of school product uh, productivity. Interesting enough, in self-reported, a national study that was conducted, this is about stress in girls. Is there a difference between girls and boys and stress? So as you can see, and if you want more information about this, I'll provide some uh, my phone number at the end. You can call me and we, we'll figure this, how to get this to you. More teen girls than boys reported symptoms of stress and are more likely to say stress impacts their happiness uh, a, a great deal. So if you look at like our, our child's perception of their appearance, they said that their appearance is a significant source of stress. As you can see, 68% said that yes, it is a significant source of stress versus 55% of boys. Again, this was a national study. Um, report feeling irritable or angry in the past month. Again, this would fall under moodiness, 45% girls and 36% boys. 
feel feel bad when comparing themselves to others on social media. 30% girls said yes, 13% of boys. Again, the cell phone is a great invention. However, it is a great source of stress and also a form of communication um, so that you feel like you're never outside of school. And as adults, we're never outside of work. Um, so again, the misuse of it, again, with bullying and threatening behaviors, again, go along with this and can be picked up. How others perceive them on social media is a significant source of stress. Now, if we look at, I think it was um, webinar number four, if I'm not mistaken, um, with the Talba County Sheriff's Office, we also looked at the impact of social media, pros and cons of social media. You can also find that online. If you need a link to that, we can send you a link to that because it talked about you know predators and um, all those kinds of things and stress and misuse and use of proper use and misuse of um, watching what our kids are on in social media or being aware of it. Um, very important. The, the statistics that are out there are pretty alarming and staggering and it would make us as parents and, and teachers paranoid to see what our kids are exposed to and the many facets and ways that people are trying to reach them that they are not even aware of. It's kind of scary, actually. Well, it is scary. Um, say that they feel pressure to be a certain way. Again, expectations. 34% say of girls say yes, that's a significant source of stress versus 25% of boys. So there is a difference um, of how, again, individually stress is perceived across the board. Again, that also matches um, levels of trauma and also with bullying. So radar, so it's the signs of reaching out for help. So how do our kids reach out for help? We need to have that, like that radar that goes on, um, that constantly surveying about around us, not thinking about just us as adults, but like the impact of whatever it is happening in our social world of our kids need to be made aware of that so we can pick that up. Just remember that 70% of all communication is nonverbal. So how do we find this out? In mental health, that would be like a, a mental status exam all, of all the unspoken words or how someone looks or dresses or acts. So there are five different modes of communication that need to be made, we need to know of. And that's nonverbal communication. Like our kids sometimes may not have the skills developed to send us messages that they're hurting. So they may act or do things for us as feeling like we should pick this up, these noticeable changes, we, sh we should pick these things up. We may be so busy ourselves as adults, we, we're not picking up these things. So it's important to slow, slow life down as much as we can so that we can have a great or better relationship or increase our relationship with our kids. Because at different times, we're all stressed out, especially now in this economy. Nonverbal communication, visual communication, how someone looks, they I'm missing a button. I, I, my, if I had hair, my hair's different. I'm not making my hair up like I normally would. I'm not wearing the jewelry I used, used to. So there are noticeable changes. Like I'm, I'm not as self-kept as I once was. Maybe I'm not using deodorant like I was. Or, you know, just noticeable changes that kids pick up on and parents and teachers need to pick up on. Listening. How difficult is it for us to listen? Very difficult sometimes because as parents or as teachers and su support staff or social workers and therapists, you know, our, you know, our job, we want to help things. We want to improve the lives of the people that we're serving or working with or love, right? So we try to fix things, but sometimes in life, kids have, also have to figure that out with our guidance. So being a good listener is probably one of the, for me personally, is one of the most difficult things to do because I want to jump right to, give me a wrench, we're going to fix this problem. So practice, we got to practice listening, take a deep breath and just listen and listen also to what not is not being said. Written communication, our English teachers, our art teachers, our music staff, our coaches, I'm, I'm sorry, not our coaches, our, it's mainly our English department, our art department, um, you know, it's important to look at those uh, self-reporting papers and what's included in them, those papers. Um, what makes me special, for example, um, 
all of those things that are written, that are proofread and read by our school staff and parents, if you proofread anything of your children, looking at their artwork in particular, there's a lot of messages in there that need, need to be picked up on because it's safe to express how I truly feel in a indirect sort of way. So I'm not called out on it. So there's a lot of messages being sent, communicated in, in written, written word and poetry and um, song lyrics and art class. Um, just incredible for that. And even on sometimes we'll see that in um, new tattoos. So there's a reason and a purpose for each and every one of those. So verbal communication, how things are said, tone, cadence and rhythm. You know, I, 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 nothing's wrong with me. So if I'm really saying that in a hastily sort of manner, what I'm really saying is there's really something wrong because I'm, I'm trying to deflect and, and send you off of my trail because if really or nothing was wrong with me, I know everything's good. You know, you could see how we're saying that with the pressure of speech, the cadence of the speech, the pressure of it, the sound, the volume of it. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration whenever we're trying to communicate or receive communication from someone else, because there's messages in, and purpose in all of our behaviors. So intervening, so what do we do? How do we pick this stuff up? How do we manage stress? It's hard to do. The thing is, and the golden rule when we're trying to manage stress is sometimes we don't realize we're being stressed out or we're in that chronic state of stress because we're in it. We don't realize we're sinking because it could be that heightened sense that we're stuck in, that we feel like it's normal in a most dysfunctional way. And because of that, we may be dysfunctioning and having the most inappropriate coping skills to deal with whatever that stressor or prolonged stressor is. So how can we work and let, mitigate a lot of these kinds of symptoms related to stress or bring that to the attention of others? Simply spending time with your child or more time and it doesn't cost money to go for walks. May go do something outside of the comfort zone. Maybe go for, uh, you know, go bowling together. That's always fun. It's good that our kids see us in a vulnerable position. Like if we throw a gutter ball, it's kind of funny, actually. So humor is really a lot of fun and is a stress reliever. Working on a project together, even building something with um, younger kids, Legos or building something with um, a deck of cards. Um, I think Django is a fun one for all ages, pulling out the blocks and seeing who knocks that over. Um, you know, that, that, you know that's, that's a great exercise to do. Exercise, physical exercise is proven to de alleviate and decrease levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, talking and just discussing things for clarity and understanding of things, of expectations. Um, you know, just working out maybe for our middle and high school students, you know, just a general, uh, you know, when we, I'm not expecting a lot of you for house chores, but this is what we need to, you know, what we all need to do. And these are all of our chores. So normalizing, we all have a role because a family is a team, just like the operation of a classroom in a, in a school district. And your job as a parent and your work, if you are working, um, you know, everything is interrelated and everything is a working part of a team. Everybody has a role to contribute to the success of the outcomes of that team. So um, getting outside, you know, again, being outside, flying a kite, going fishing, which I love to do again, um, just going for long walks, talking. And silence is good sometimes. And, um, you know, just doing, going to a movie, even though there's little talk, but you can at least at the end of a movie, you can discuss about your thoughts about the movie with each other and fun. And a good humorous movies are a lot of fun. And because uh, humor does decrease levels of stress. Sleep. Um, looking at why I'm not sleeping or oversleeping, providing reassurance that things are going to go through this together. I'm on your team. We're going to work through this together. You know, if you want, we can meet with the teacher to figure these out. You know, if I know, know more about what's expected of this project or this paper or how to study for this test, I will feel much more confident in doing better on this test. And sometimes, you know, our parents, 
If you look at elementary school, when we have back to school night, you know, we have a lot of parent uh, enrollment and participation. Middle school, we have decreased. And then when our kids need us most, which is at the high school level, we need more parent participation and communication with our school staff, with our teachers to try to figure things out because the, the consequences of making a bad decision are much greater. So working through any sort of need at school, please, parents, please reach out to your, your child's teachers. And if you feel like there's any decrease in grades, let's try to figure, figure out why there's a decrease and what we needed to do to support maybe some study skills or extra credit or anything we can do to help your child perform as we all want to do well in school. Um, provide So that's providing reassurance and support and talking and figuring things out together as a team. Parents, together, design maybe at home some sort of time management schedule, monitoring of when kids maybe have access to social media or games and those kinds of limiting those. You know, any sort of rule of thumb if they're spending more time on, you know, like computer games or social media and less time on schoolwork during the course of a year, there's probably going to be room for improvement. Um, and getting outside versus being home all of the time on the computer really does work well. Um, again, um, parents, that that is a decision and time management schedule that you have to decide on. School counselor, um, you know, if you have any any concerns with any of the kids, any students, whether if they're affecting your child or if your child is not performing well or you're noticing some changes, to reach out to your school counselor. You know, they, they have a lot of trained skills to help you out because, again, as parents, sometimes we're the last to find these things out. And we when we do get a call maybe from the school counselor or school social worker, we're like, Maybe defensive, like, what? What do you mean, my child? Well, we've noticed these changes and we're trying to work through things with you. Have you noticed these or are you seeing these same changes at home? And if you are, we got to figure these things out or how can I help you to so that, you know, so that Rob, for example, um, can do better in school or change in behavior or what can we do to make a success plan? Anything we can do to help because we, again, we all want the same exact thing as you do. We want our children to be successful students and have a great productive future and make great choices and citizens of our community. So are, is there anything that, and I don't know of anyone in a school setting or an adult setting that hasn't gone through difficult times in our lives where counseling, having that, having that, have that, that neutral person to talk to, where it sheds a different light or perspective or a skill that we have that we are not utilizing or using to help conquer whatever it is that may be affecting us in our lives or our perception of our future or our past. You know, um, the worst thing we could do is get stuck with maybe something we haven't worked through in our past because it's definitely going to affect our motivation in the future. So having whatever that difficulty is, and we do see a lot of... Um, a lot of students going through a difficult time, maybe because of mom and dad's separation or changes at home, or maybe their older brother or sister is going to, you know, a college and left the house, any sort of changes, you know, it's really reflective in our school setting because we do see those changes and they need to be addressed so that the child knows how to develop the skills to handle some of major life stresses that they maybe didn't even ask for, but we have to deal with that. Um, and we do have and offer three different levels of counseling at school. We have our school our, our, our school counselor, we have our school social worker, and then again, we have 10 contractual provider agencies that come into our schools that provide confidential school counseling services um, that help alleviate some of the stress of running around after school with going to an outpatient mental health um, office. So we offer that in school, um, you know, increased communication with school and support staff. You know, um, parenting is probably the most difficult job that's out there. Um, and our teachers also have a very difficult job. Um, and sometimes things happen in our ch children's lives that, um, you know, they need all of us on deck to help support them to be successful. And we are here for you. You know, um, again, we all want the same thing. 
Um, so my name is Dr. Rob Schmidt. You guys, this is number seven and um, my phone number there. Anytime you can give a call, please, when you do, leave a message, leave your your phone number where, where it's easily to get or access you. Um, or if you have a question, you can email me uh, at rschmidt at talbotschools.org and you can get a hold of me anytime. Please don't hold back. Now, we do have a next webinar coming up on April the 24th um, from 2.30 to 3.30 live. And if it is not, it's videoed like this. It's bullying prevention, identification, and intervention. And typically, um, we will review this and let you know what we have for bullying prevention and identification and sometimes what the what the reason it is behind the bullying um, and how the bully or sometimes um, is also suffering some significant things, feeling like they need to bully others to fill that void of whatever it is that they're going through. So we'll cover both sides of the from the victimization piece of that to what is causing or promoting that person to be a bully. What is getting what are they getting out of that? Also, how schools intervene with this and the process and procedure and looking at um, some of the outcomes of that, those identification and interventions that take place at school and what we can all do to help offset that or to address that appropriately. And at any time your son or daughter you feel like are being bullied, um, you can go on the Talbot County Public School website and complete a bullying uh, form that will go to that or your school, your child's school's administrator that that can be addressed as soon as possible. So should you have any questions or concerns between now and then, please feel free to reach out to me. And I hope everyone's doing well. Again, should you have any concerns, please reach out and you can call me or email me again at rschmidt at talbotschools.org. Looking forward to everyone out there to being a part of webinar number eight. And I thank you very much for being a part of this.